Have We Forgotten Nightfall? We're going to be looking at John chapter 12, verses 31 through 50. And we're still on the same kind of theme right now. Last week's sermon's title was, Why We Remember. So obviously the forgotten part's a little bit of a play on word, but not really. Let's go ahead and begin with the scripture. Starting with verse 31, it reads, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. We're on our way up to the crucifixion. Jesus knows the time is now. When he says judgment, I want you to hold on to that thought. Judgment of the world. That's the thought I want lightly riding in the back of your mind as we go through the rest of this chapter. Continuing on with verses 35 through 36. Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. I've got a personal experience I can relate to this in a sort of little way. There was a time briefly in my job when a window was open, the window of opportunity. And one of the grad students that I did a lot of work with, he realized the same thing I did. Things can be done now. And for that brief time, when that window was open, or that door was open, whichever you want to think about, it was like running downhill. And we were running for all that was within us, trying to get as far as we could, knowing we were probably going to trip at some point because we were going so fast. But the point for us was, let's see how far we can go. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, how far can we take this? The opportunity. It's almost like if somebody said, here's a way to make $1,000 again and again and again. Would you do that thing one day? Imagine it only takes an hour, one hour to make a thousand dollars. Wow, I could work just an hour a day and at the end of a year have $365,000. I wouldn't even have to work every day. I could still make a whole lot more than I'm making now. Wow, I think I'll go ahead and work two hours this first day and then I'll take a break tomorrow because I already work tomorrow's one hour. I didn't say you could only work one hour a day. And I didn't say how long this $1,000 an hour activity was going to last. I just said, right now, you can do this one thing and make $1,000. We know we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We know that quote unquote, all good things come to an end. Keep that thought in mind. Continue on with verses 37 through 41. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, 
He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Hardened their hearts. Their eyes were blinded, but what was blinding really? Was it God? Or was it their own willful choice? Think about who Jesus is talking to right now. Jesus was talking to those who had seen the miracles. The Jewish rulers have already complained, look, we can't stop him. Everybody's going to him. Why? Because they saw the power of God giving witness to the things Jesus had said. And yet, their eyes were blinded, not because God had to do anything to cover their eyes. Truth is, when God blinds their eyes at this time, he's not covering them. He's uncovering them even more. He's showing them truth, and they're not comfortable with that truth. And because they're not comfortable with that truth, He's given more of that same kind of truth and putting it out in a way they can't escape from it. And because that's not a truth they want, having to face more of the truth is what's hardening their hearts and blinding their eyes. All right, we can look at that and say, yeah, that's them. I'd like to put it into a more current context. Okay, maybe this isn't current for my kids. They weren't around when it happened. The school I graduated from has a great football team. Sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not, but that's okay. And one of the games they were playing many years ago, wasn't going so hot. It wasn't against a top team either. Our team just wasn't pulling it together and doing the things they knew to do as a team. And people were sitting on their hands. There wasn't a lot of support coming from the crowd. They were silent. Oh wait, I'm not talking about the crowd in the stand. I'm talking about the teammates that were on the sidelines. The second stringers, third stringers, B team. They were sitting down and they were quiet. I can't tell you how that game ended. I can tell you what happened the next week. Next week was an away game. And next week, the only people that were on the bus or on the plane were those who played the game the previous week. Everyone who'd been sitting on their hands, sitting on the bench, didn't get to come. And the coach let them know in no uncertain terms, and I know of this because it was in the paper. He was not happy with those who weren't on the field doing less than everything they could to support those who were in the thick of it. 
I can guarantee you, the next game they had an opportunity to be present at, those guys were on their feet. Good play or bad play, they were encouraging the guys on the field. Letting them know they were there to support them come thick or come thin. Because the previous week, the coach had thinned it out. He had cleared the benches. Yes, I'm smiling. You now realize the reason why this video began with that first picture. I'm only smiling because now you understand why that picture was there. I'm shredded because I understand what that picture means on a totally different level. Think about it. Think about where we've been. Think about what has led up to this moment in time. When we're talking about John chapter 12, he's raised Lazarus from the dead. And they saw it. And they couldn't respond the way they should have because their hearts were already calloused. Their position in their society, how it was going to look, was more important than truth, more important than the presence of God in their midst. Night was falling. Things were about to get a whole lot worse. And I'm not just talking Calvary. Look at your history. The procur sorry. The persecution may have started with one man on Calvary's cross. But for the hundred years, hundreds of years that follow. The persecution will become greater and greater. In part, because of the first verse we read. It was judgment of the world. And you know what? We already know from John, that's not talking about the lost. About those who never tried to make God a priority in their lives. Because they're already judged. The judgment we're talking about is about those who knew and wouldn't act about those who saw the difference God could make in a life. Physical healing, meeting needs that had been unmet. And that wasn't enough to make a difference here. In the United States, we have had a long time of good, easy opportunity. The opportunity to be out in the community having an impact for God. And, okay, I'll be the first to admit, it's not always easy. I already told you in a previous sermon, my number one prayer when it came to door knocking was, please don't let it be a dog that answers this door. 
I went door knocking in fear. Not of what people would think of me, but of a dog. But I did it. How many of us have been sitting on our hands in a pew with the understanding, well, I don't have a useful talent. The one talent man had a talent. He just buried it. Well, I haven't had the calling. Jesus dying on the cross wasn't calling enough. Well, I don't have the time. Really. So you're not working a 40 hour work week to get by. You're working like what, 120 hours a week? Eating, sleeping, and back to the grindstone of another 120 hour work week? Really? Or is it that God is not a priority and the heart is hardened? There's a passage in Amos I'd like to read. It's Amos chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? We can look around us today and see parts of our nation on fire. We can look around us today and see murder and death in this world that we live in. The time of running downhill easy is past. I don't know when, I don't know how long the next window of opportunity will be. I will tell you this, it doesn't get easier to soften your heart as the night falls. Fear helps shut us down. Worry and dread cause us to become inactive, unresponsive. The last verses of chapter 12 are for I have not spoken on my own authority but the father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak and I know that his command is everlasting life therefore whatever I speak just as the father has told me so I speak it wasn't Jesus they were rejecting. It was the Father. When we choose not to act, it's not just Jesus we're letting down. It's the Father's truth. We're timid or too timid to act upon. We're not called to be comatose Christians. We're called to be convicted. We're called to be courageous for God. 
We're called to live a life based on Christ. We die to sin and rise anew, transformed. Not transformed to the image of death. Christ didn't die to die again. He died and rose. And if the church doesn't rise, the church will die. It's up to each of us to choose to make the difference now. It's not going to get easier. I can almost guarantee it's going to get harder. But you know what? Even if it's going to get harder, now is the easier then. Now is the opportune time to strive to make the difference for God on God's terms. Funny part is, now is always the time to strive to make the difference for God on God's terms. I'm just letting you know, if we're not running down the hill for all we're worth, we're like those that were sitting on the benches that were worthless to the rest of the team. God has cleared the benches with a virus. Are we going to clear the benches because of hearts of stone?